Hello, my name is Glenn Jankowski. I'm a senior lecturer at Leeds Beckett University, and this is a recording of a conference presentation I recently did on the psychology of men and women's hair loss. So first up, what does the psychological research on this say? Well, here are two examples on the screen. Typically, it concludes that the greater hair loss you have, the more psychologically devastated you are. German and colleagues, for instance, said in 1998, men with greater hair loss had more bother, concern about getting older, perceived notability to others and greater dissatisfaction with their hair appearance than men with less hair loss. Similarly, Cash, Price and Savin in 1993 concluded that androgenetic alopecia clearly was a stressful experience for both sexes, etc. So these studies are typically surveys or questionnaires that assess the extent of hair loss people have and the self-reported levels of psychological well-being people have. And what they do is they see if there's a correlation between these levels. And typically they conclude there is a correlation. The more hair loss you have or the earlier it begins, the more psychologically devastated you are. Some studies go even further than this and don't say only that hair loss is psychologically devastating, but also that hair loss treatment will improve your psychological well-being. So Afonso and colleagues in 2005 conclude that 43 to 59% of men using hair loss treatments experience improvements in parameters of self, esteem and perceptions of personal attractiveness. That's all well and good, but this research does have problems and needs scrutiny. So we should ask ourselves, is hair loss always psychologically devastating? Why is hair loss psychologically devastating, especially when for most people with hair loss, it is an utterly benign condition? So hair loss isn't a medical illness. In most people, it's a benign change to the bodily appearance. Hair loss can sometimes be a symptom of an underlying illness or stress it on the body, such as chemotherapy. But in most cases, it's a benign issue. And the not having hair on your head has no medical complication to it. And of course, can we use methods apart from questionnaires to assess the psychology of hair loss? And in particular, because we know that people reporting their psychological well-being by a questionnaire uh, isn't always accurate. So I've been interested in psychological hair loss research for at least three years. Uh, my PhD, which I completed in 2016, was on the topic of men's body image and hair loss is a key part of that. So when I've been reading the literature on hair loss, how do people cope, how common it is, etc., I kept noticing the same poorly constructed questions used across studies. Now that's unusual because researchers either use well-constructed questions again and again in different studies, or they might use a poorly constructed question that they make up themselves, but there's no real reason why somebody else should use that if it's poorly constructed. So I looked closer at the literature on the psychology of hair loss uh, in 2014. And I found that out of 11 studies that I could find, nine had serious conflicts of interest. Five of them were authored or co-authored by a pharmaceutical employee. So Jan Pashir is a former Merck employee and Merck make the uh, hair loss product Rogaine. And Thomas Rode is also a Merck employee. And indeed, Thomas Rode on one of these papers lists his email address as rhodes at merck.com. Other studies, the other four out of these 11, received funding by hair loss companies and Merck again, or the Upjohn company, which used to make Rogaine, and I think have now merged with Merck. So you can see on the screen that this paper by Thomas Cash and colleagues uh, states clearly, but in, in discreetly as well, that this is supported by a grant or funds from the Upjohn company. Other studies also will write this quite discreetly on the paper somewhere. Okay, well, what's the big problem with big pharmaceuticals like Merck funding this research? Well, of course, there's a huge conflict of interest. Funding comes with strings. So there are some studies that have been conducted by um, researchers on hair loss that have not found the findings that 
pharmaceutical companies wanted and have therefore been stopped from publishing. Uh, typically, many doctors or researchers sign gagging clauses when they receive the funding from these companies. And these clauses or contracts will stop the researcher from publishing anything that the pharmaceutical company or funding body generally do not want published. We know that Merck in particular, it's been well publicised, have a history of funding research that sees their products and concludes that their products are favourable to health. And this, of course, isn't just related to hair loss, but all the other pharmaceutical um, pills that Merck creates. In particular, there was a hit list of doctors who criticise a Merck product, Viox, where the doctors who, who talked about the side effects of this product that Merck was making were um, Merck wanted to neutralise, discredit, or destroy these doctors and ruin their reputation so that Merck ultimately would not receive any less uh, profits in people buying this product, Viox. Um, and of course, as you can see on this um, newspaper article on the right, which has been well established, Merck also have created, and they're not the only company to do this, but they're one of the particular ones, uh, fake medical journals, the Australian Journal of Bone and Joint Medicine, in which they can publish studies that are very positive about their products. So in terms of hair loss, it makes it particularly tricky because research on the psychology of hair loss has a huge conflict of interest. And so we're not sure if we can trust the findings that hair loss is always universally psychologically devastating because there's a logical reason that the researchers might have found that or massaged their data to find that or constructed their questions in a way that might reveal that data specifically in order to point the way to recommending pharmaceutical interventions for the hair loss sufferers. So if we look at a non-funded hair loss study by Dirk Kranz in 2011, published in the journal Body Image, we find more refreshing and accurate results. So Kranz surveyed men's psychological impact and coping levels with hair loss. And him and colleagues found that those that tried to conceal their hair loss, whether through pharmaceutical intervention or wigs or otherwise, coped worse and had poorer psychological well-being than those who accepted it and didn't try to conceal it. Now that makes quite intuitive sense for lots of people because we know that comb overs, for instance, or um, trying to avoid wind or rain or anything that might reveal hair loss when you're trying to conceal it is really stressful. And this research backs that up that for some people, it at minimum suggests some people might be better off not necessarily paying Merck a lot of money for their hair loss treatment, but rather uh, accepting their hair loss. Okay, so let's also consider other research on hair loss that is in that is also not funded by pharmaceuticals. So this is research that I and colleagues published in 2014, and we looked at every ish image of a man and a woman in 32 magazines, uh, including Attitude, FHM, Gay Times, and Men's Health. We coded these images for their appearance aspects and sexualization, including their levels of hair loss. So in total of the 4,934 images of men that were available, only 9% of them had any hair loss at all. And most of that hair loss was minor recession at the temples. It wasn't uh, more significant hair loss. Of 1,151 images of women featured, none had any hair loss at all. Similarly, the same team conducted a content analysis of websites that men popularly use, dating websites and porn websites like match.com, gaydar.co.uk, Xtube and Xhamster. We found that of the 1,400 images of men featured, only 3.3% had any hair loss. And of women, 
714 images, none had any hair loss. So for men, 3.3% um, on the website, 9% of the magazines. This is particularly underrepresentative. Men's health per port to represent all men, but they're obviously not representing balding men and neither of the websites. We would expect a much higher prevalence uh, in these magazines because the general population of men by 30, according to the NHS, about a third of men will will have some hair loss by 30 and by 70 70 percent or most men will have some hair loss for women the prevalence is certainly lower but there are women with hair loss and they weren't represented at all so hair loss in porn in dating websites in mainstream magazines is rarely represented when it is represented it's represented negatively and this is by this is shown by great research by kevin harvey in 2013 and he analyzed the images and text on popular hair loss websites and he found there are four common ways male hair loss was represented first that the balding man is outcast and lonely and sad and suicidal second that men with full heads of hair or the hirsute man is attractive successful and of course gets the attractive woman because he's always straight like so third, that hair loss is an illness that needs medical treatment. And fourth, that you can self-evaluate your own hair loss. You can take control of your hair loss. You can act now and you can prevent it. And it's you who can do this. So just to give examples of the kind of um, ways in which hair loss is represented like this, we can see the Hirsute man being attractive from these hair loss adverts. Losing your hair, you can do something about it, which also ties to the self-evaluate your hair loss theme that Kevin Harvey brought up. Losing your hair is a choice. So both men here are have full heads of hair. They have facial symmetrical faces. They look like they're muscular and lean from what we can see. And what you can see on this bottom Im image where it says losing your hair is a choice and it zeroes in on the hairline corner here, that it's up to you to stop it. You can do something about it, but you have to act. This is what this advert is saying. And of course, try it for free, try it for her, try it, try it for you, keep what's important to you. And so there's a double meaning of this Rogaine advert. Not only will you be able to keep your hair via their product, but also you'll be able to keep the attractive wife or girlfriend or, or woman in the advert because that's important. So what it's saying is if you lose your hair, you will be unattractive to partners or to women. OK, another example of Harvey's themes in which it shows that hair loss is negatively represented are these series of ads from Spenson, a hair loss pharmaceutical company, showing a solitary hair or two solitary hairs in a devastated landscape, saying there is still hope, but only if you act now. And by that, they mean by their pharmaceutical product. This, another um, advert by the Svensson company, um, where it shows a hair loss follicle representing a hair loss sufferer about to jump off a building, presumably because they're suicidal, lonely, devastated, etc. And the only person available to help this suicidal person, this hair follicle, is the Svensson company, the pharmaceutical treatment. And again, the hair loss sufferer is suicidal and the only way that they can receive help, the only people there to help them are pharmaceutical companies providing pharmaceutical treatments. Now, of course, it goes about saying that pharmaceutical treatments for hair loss are not always effective. The limited evidence we have on them that have been blind, randomised controlled trials suggest that Rogaine and Propecia can be effective although we don't know who funds that research and how accurate that research is, but we certainly know that it's not always effective. So imagine if somebody is suicidal or psychologically devastated from their hair loss, they are told that their one lifeline is this pharmaceutical treatment and even then it doesn't work for them. How, how is that going to help? Secondly, of course, even if these pharmaceutical treatments do work all the time, which we know they don't, they're expensive, they have side effects that we don't often know about, and they're not the only solution to, or the only behavior or response to hair loss. As Dirk Kranz's research suggested earlier, sometimes accepting hair loss for some people might be the best route to go down. 
Hair loss for websites such as hairlosstalk.com also have a particular conflict of interest. They are marketed as providing a forum and support for hair loss. Of course, however, they only recommend pharmaceutical treatments, transplants, wigs or concealment rather than any kind of therapy or acceptance of hair loss. And of course, Hair Loss Talk has been previously funded by pharmaceutical companies. It is certainly close to other perspectives as well, which I found out when I tried to um, post a similar message as I'm doing today on the website and was later unceremoniously banned. Okay, so to conclude, hair loss is represented as a devastating illness whenever, whenever it is represented. Pharmaceuticals and others make profits when men and women seek out intervention. So there's a vested interest in research saying hair loss is going to devastate you because that those people who read that research are going to think, OK, I'm going to buy products from Merck and other people in order to stop that devastation. And of course, that makes Merck and other people more profitable. These interventions may be expensive, they're not necessarily effective, and sometimes, of course, they cause health risks. So what does the psychology of hair loss tell us? Well, very little, because what appears to be research is actually more of an advert. And then finally, something we really need to think about, and from my thesis um, and research on body image shows, is why must we, if the problem is with the culture, i.e. hair loss representation in media, why must we change the individual, i.e. transplant heart, hair on individuals? That isn't to say that those who seek out hair loss interventions, pharmaceuticals, uh, wigs, whatever, should be stigmatised for that. That's not the problem. Individuals have to cope in the culture they're in. And for some people, changing the themselves is easier than changing the culture. What this is to say, though, is that there is a problem of the research on hair loss. There is a conflict of interest there and that for some people who don't want pharmaceutical treatment, who maybe can't afford it or don't um, want to go through the health risks, then they should be able to access psychological support and also see themselves better represented in the media. Here are some key references. And if you want to contact me, my email was on the start of the video. Thank you very much.